All right. We're going to get right into this one. And um, it will be, it's one of the, one of the more, more in-depth ones we'll be doing. So let's jump right in. Um, and our scripture reading will come from Matthew chapter 23. Verses 37 and 38. Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 and 38. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Our message for the second session today is entitled Lessons for Understanding the War in the Middle East. Lessons for Understanding the War in the Middle East. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to study your word. I ask once again, Lord, that you just make me a nail on the wall. And upon that nail, Lord, hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. Father God, remove the distractions. And help us to focus now on your word. For we need to hear a word from you. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Let the church say amen. And amen. We'll read those verses again. Matthew chapter 24, uh, Matthew chapter 23, verse 37 and 38. Jesus had just finished driving the money changers out of the temple for the second and last time in his ministry. He does this at the beginning of his ministry and at the end of his ministry. As he is leaving, he says these words. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often? When I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. The disciples, when they heard this, were in full out shock. This is the Jesus that is to be crowned king, and here he has decried the temple that, in fact, the house of God has been left desolate. As he leaves the temple, Matthew 24 and verse 1 gives greater insight into what's happening. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came for to show him the buildings of the temple. Jesus said unto them, see ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. I, I, I build this context, this background, because what we're going to talk about now are some of the uh, unfortunate false prophecies and prophets that have twisted the way people see the Middle East and particularly the role of the modern-day nation of Israel. You go forward in this chapter, Jesus goes on and says this, and now we're speaking about the destruction of Jerusalem in that time. Matthew 24, 15 says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let them him which is on the house stop not come down and take anything out of the house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. There's a lot in here. One, you know that Jesus didn't do away with the Sabbath, because if he had done away with the Sabbath, in AD 70, when this uh, catastrophe happens, you would have been no worry about a Sabbath. Somebody ought to say amen. But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. And of course, Jerusalem falls in AD 70. It is uh, the, the Roman general, Titus, who pulls it off. It is a terrible siege first, 
And eventually the, the, the rebellious uh, Jews are overthrown and the temple is taken. The irony is that Titus tried to save the temple. He did not want them to deface or, 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 or disrespect the temple. But because of the resistance the Jews gave in the first, second, and third attempts in trying to take uh, the city and the temple, by the fourth time, the Romans just overpowered them. And the Roman soldiers, um, they actually disobeyed the general and made sure to tear down every single stone and burn the place down. The prophecy of Jesus was completely and accurately fulfilled at that time. The Christians had listened to the warning of Christ, and when they saw the abomination of desolation, which was the mounting of pagan armies on the holy ground around the city, the holy ground actually extended beyond just the grounds of the temple. When they saw that and they knew what was coming, the Christians fled the city before this last siege. And it is said that not one Christian died in the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Watch this. This is from the Youth's Instructor, November 13th. Sister White says this. The horrible cruelties enacted in the destruction of Jerusalem are a demonstration of Satan's vindictive power over those who yield to his control. God does not stand toward the sinner as an executor of the sentence against transgression. But he leaves the rejecters to his, of his mercy to themselves to reap that which they have sown. The destruction of Jerusalem is a solemn warning to all who are trifling with the offers of divine grace and resisting the pleadings of divine mercy. It's a warning for us. We'll come back to that. But let me throw this in real quick. Because people say, how could a loving God allow these things to happen? Understand that God is a gentleman. He does not overstep his bounds. And when you say you do not want him in, his in your life, you do not want him in your life, as the Jews did in this time, God he pulls back and removes himself. But what we often don't realize is that there is another force at work. And guess what happens? The devil now has full sway to do what he wants. This is what happened to Pharaoh of Egypt. The Bible says his heart was hardened. God didn't reach in and harden Pharaoh's heart. All God did was keep showing Pharaoh that he was actually the one that was God. Pharaoh thought he was divine. God showed it, Pharaoh that Jehovah God is the one who is divine. And every time God showed it, his wicked heart hardened. There are lessons to be learned. When this war broke out, we, our, our realtor is a wonderful guy. He's a former Orthodox Jew now, an atheist, very politically liberal guy. Um, and when the war broke out in Israel, after October 7th, he was in a panic and a flush, and he called me, um, you know, and, and he, he, he doesn't really like to talk religion, obviously. And he called me and he said, I, you'll know, I need you to tell me what's actually going on in Israel right now. Understanding prophecy is important because people around us will want answers as these events begin to unfold. Now, there are certain lessons that you need in order to understand what's happening in the Middle East. Certain things that we have to understand. Number one, no promise is given. This is the first lesson. No promise is given that Jerusalem or Israel would be restored as the center of prophecy or spiritual teachings. I read them already to you, right? Jesus left the place and said, I leave your house until you're desolate. He wept over Jerusalem. Now, let me show you some verses that will quantify this because this is the most important, the first lesson and probably what I'm going to go most in depth with because you have to understand this or you get swept into delusion. Here, Matthew 21 and verse 43 says, Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. This is what he told the nation of Israel uh, before he even prophesied the destruction of Jerusalem. He said the kingdom of God will be what? Taken from you and given to another nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. We're going to show you who that is in a minute. Matthew 23, we read already. Behold, your house is left unto you what? Desolate. So then people ask the question, but aren't there Old Testament promises that Israel would be restored? Doesn't 1948 and the establishment of the modern nation of Israel fulfill these prophecies? And this is where a lot of people get hung up. 
They think that in 1948, Israel comes on the scene and many of the Old Testament prophecies are now fulfilled. Let me give you an example. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 24, it says, For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. And they say, 1948, after the Bal Balfour Declaration, which is still a very heated the thing that happened, uh, the British uh, Balfour did this thing and uh, set up the state. It was supposed to be a two, it was actually supposed to be a two-state solution from its inception. Go back and look at the maps. But the, 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 the Arab world decided they did not want that solution. And so the war broke out in 1948. And basically every 10 years or so, or sometimes five years, there's another war. If you just look, there's been war there constantly since. So some people say in 1948, when the, the Ashkenazic Jews of Europe and the Sephardic views of some parts of the Middle East and North Africa uh, kind of began to come together in Israel, that this prophecy was fulfilled and hence, we need to, as Christians, respect the nation of Israel in a very special way. But let's read the rest of the prophecy. Verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols, and will I cleanse you. So one of the conditions is, if you're going to come back together, you will be cleansed of all of the idolatry, paganism, secularism, all these things should go away. Look at what Ezekiel 36, 26 says. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. So what is the condition of the, all of the nations coming back and, do it, and, and being set up? This is way back in the time of Ezekiel, and Ezekiel is writing, while they're still in Babylonian captivity. Amen? This is the condition for them to get back to their homeland. But notice, it is it's actually something that speaks to each one of us. In Ezekiel, it says that God will take out the stony heart from you, your heart is your mind, and will give you a heart of flesh. And he'll put his spirit within you. And look at what, the, look at the, what happens when this happens. What is the consequence, the byproduct of this is, that you will walk in my statutes and you shall do what? Keep my judgments and do them. And then the question is asked, did they fulfill that condition? Because if they did, this is the, what they would get. Ezekiel 36, 28. And you shall dwell in the land that I, will give, uh, that I gave to your fathers and ye shall be my people and I will be your God. So you would say, well, see, that prophecy is fulfilled in 1948. We have to fight to keep Israel alive. Here's what the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary says. Ye shall be my people. This promise was conditional on the realization of the spiritual purity described above. Had the necessary revival been effected, their residence in the land would have been permanent. Jerusalem would have stood forever. From her would have gone out the dove of peace to bring the whole world under the influence of the true religion. The words, ye shall be my people and I will be your God, are descriptive of the covenant relationship in which Jehovah stood toward Israel. The covenant included more than national independence, and prosperity. It comprehended, watch this church, it comprehended the whole plan to make Israel the spiritual nucleus of a worldwide missionary program. The rejection of the covenant, as you see in Matthew 21, 43, resulted in the removal of the spiritual privilege. It did not necessarily imply that the Jews would never establish an independent political state, the present state of Israel is in no wise a fulfillment of these ancient forecasts, nor would any mass return of the Jews to Palestine be a fulfillment of these predictions. Jesus positively stated that the covenant promise now has been given to another nation. Watch this, church. Namely, the Christian church. Through this body, God is now working to evangelize the world. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Whatever people on earth are his people do not function to have a permanent earthly kingdom. They function to build the kingdom of God. That's why the church is now modern, is really, I should say, is spiritual Israel. Because our role isn't to establish a kingdom on earth. Our job is to build the kingdom of heaven. This is the danger of a lot of the evangelicals in the United States. They are seeking to establish a political order on earth 
and I'm going to show you where they get it from here in a second, that would actually set up a kingdom of God that would stay here. Donald Trump just came out a, a few weeks ago with his own Bible. Did you guys see this? This guy's really selling some stuff now. He was selling some sneakers not too long ago. They actually did pretty good. <laughs> sneakers sold out. <laughs> Ugliest sneakers I've ever seen. Um, and then he made a Bible and he put the, 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 he put the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence in the Bible and sold that. Because people think that through these political means, the church will win its victory. Like I showed you this earlier. To do that is to commit spiritual fornication. Because if the church says, I will rely on the state to gain victory, it means you're cheating on God because he is the one that must give victory. Here's what Romans 11 says. In verse 18, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say that the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, look at why the, the, the nation of Israel was rejected. Here it is. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. And they stand, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, don't get arrogant, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, the original nation of Israel, take heed lest he what? Also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which dwell, on them which fell, severity, but toward you goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, Paul gives this warning, you also shall be cut off. Why were they cut off? Was there 812? I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. They were cut off because they rejected the law. The Pharisees added to the law things that didn't belong. Before that, they rejected the law. The law is important. Look at it says in verse 14, for Israel have forgotten his maker and built temples, and Judah has multiplied fed cities, but I will send a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour the palaces thereof. They forgot their God, and they rejected the commandments of God. And I submit to you that the people who are pushing modern-day Israel have also rejected the commandments of God because they refuse to accept the fourth commandment. Lesson number two, there's no need for a third temple to be built. No third temple needs to be built at all. And this is what they're after. In fact, after Donald Trump, you guys remember Donald Trump uh, moved the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv, Israel, where I used to live. I used to live outside of Tel Aviv in Netanya in Israel. He moved the embassy from there, and he moved it to Jerusalem. The evangelicals in our country, they were cheering. Oh, we're going to build a third temple. Now, that Christmas after he did it, so, some folk we know that, that are not that are evangelical, they, moved, they went to Israel to go help build the temple. I said, what are, I, I was curious. Like, what did they build? The question for the Adventist Christian is this. Is there a need for a third temple? Well, that's right. Let's look at this thing. This is from um, Israel Magazine, the Messianic Magazine. And it shows that there are these false end time prophecies. End time prophecy. Why is the third temple so important? The Hebrew prophets all proclaimed that in the last days, the exiles of Israel will return to the promised land and the temple would be rebuilt. Look at the quote. They quote Ezekiel as well, a different chapter, 37, 28. Then the nations will know that I, the Lord, made make Israel holy when my sanctuary is among them forever. These phenomenal end time events are unfolding before our eyes. That's what they say. Look at the, the war that happened. When, but listen, there were people in America celebrating October 7th because they knew Israel would retaliate. They knew it was going to be a terrible war. And they thought maybe now they would cast off the Palestinians for good and be able to build their temple in peace. People were happy that the war started. They said, look at this. Jesus is about to return. That's a crazy way to view world history and current events. But here, let me, go, let me show you some of this. Why American evangelicals are a huge base of support for Israel. And they, this article is a really good article, Christians United for Israel. Israel, you are not alone. The United States actually sends, as you all know, billions of dollars in support of Israel and its defense. And Israel is the only democracy in the region that does give Israel its credit. Um, there are rights and free, religious freedoms that exist there that honestly don't exist in other places nearby. This is, the, this is just the reality of it. 
So America, politically, if they want to support a democracy, you know, that's politics. The problem comes when religion and politics start to mix. With a constant turmoil preventing stability in the Middle East, this is from one of the articles, uh, many are speculating about whether the Jewish temple will be rebuilt. Entire Christian ministries are established to assist in the building of the temple. Uh, of the temple too. They say, hasten the return of Jesus. For many, a rebuilt temple will signal the start of the final events of Earth's history. However, most of the speculation for a rebuilt temple springs from a single vague reference in 2 Thessalonians 2 dealing with the Antichrist. And here's the verse. Let no one deceive you, but that day will not come unless the, unless the falling away comes first. And a man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who exposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. Here it is. This is why they think a third temple needs to be built. So that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Who is that? The Antichrist. So their argument is, I'm going to read you some more here in a second. We have to build a third temple so that Antichrist has somewhere to sit. Many say that for the Antichrist to sit in the temple, it will need to be rebuilt. Those who support this belief are known as Christian Zionists. And they include such popular writers as Hal Lindsey, Tim LaHaye, uh, preachers like John Hagee, 70 million copies of books between the three of them. The most popular is this one, the Left Behind series of books by Tim LaHaye, uh, or this is the movie that they made out of the books. But Tim LaHaye, um, Tim LaHaye and, uh, and Hal Lindsey wrote this book. Hal Lindsey also wrote the book, The Late Great Planet Earth. These books took off and they changed, for many Christians back in the last century, they changed their view of prophecy from a more historical version to a futurist version. I don't have time to get into it today, but the futurist version of prophecy comes out of the Jesuit order. Okay. Two Jesuits that actually did it and created the system because they needed to take the heat off of the Vatican and the papacy. So they said, listen, these prophecies are for now. The Pope can't be the Antichrist. That's going to happen way in the future. So they pushed it out, and this is why these doctrines came into being. And now, it's not just Catholics that believe it. The majority of folks who should call themselves Protestants believe it as well. Look, for many evangelicals, Jerusalem is about prophecy, not politics. CNN. Half of evangelists support Israel. Evan, sorry, half of evangelicals support Israel because they believe it is important for fulfilling end-time prophecy. It's interesting. So here's what's deep. U.S. foreign pro Some people think, you know, you'd never have a, you could never have a Sunday law in the United States. This is a lunacy of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But who would have thought a hundred years ago that America would support to the tune of billions of dollars a small nation in the Middle East because the, a strong support comes from a religious misunderstanding of end-time prophecy. A you know, hundred years ago, it would have been just as Looney Tunes to say America is going to support a tiny little country the size of New Jersey in the Middle East and billions of dollars because of what they believe the Bible says. And just as they have misinterpreted this prophecy, church, they will misinterpret and come up with a Sunday law. Now watch this. Which of the following contribute to your support of the modern state of Israel? Evangelical Attitudes Toward Israel Research Study, Lifeway Research, from 2017. The first one, they say, like over 50% of the Bible says God gave the land of Israel to the Jewish people. Number two, Israel is the historic Jewish homeland. Number three, Israel is important for fulfilling biblical prophecy. All greater than 50% of evangelicals believe this. And these folks elect people and put them into office, like our current, Mike Johnson, our current um, Speaker of the House of Representatives, he's like, Number three in line from the president, if something happens, he believes this. And he will support this. And this is what you have to understand. In a representative government, when this many people believe something, some of these folks actually get into power and get to make decisions. This is why we know that some of the prophecies that they say we as Adventists are crazy to believe can come to pass because it doesn't take everybody agreeing on it. It is a representative government. And if you make it so that Following along with what is done benefits you. There are people who go along with it, and that's those who receive the mark of the beast in their head. Now watch this. This is um, John Agee on the right, one of the rabbis that he works with. Christians United for Israel. 
I want you to see what, uh, from an interview John Hagee gave. Are the Jews going to recognize the Messiah as Jesus in the end? Look at what he says. Now, this is, this has showed you the depth of their, their deception. He says, we are Gentiles. We don't have a covenant. You have a covenant. We don't. And speaking to a, Jew, a Jewish uh, uh, a journalist. And that's the only way we get plugged in to have eternal life. Is that true? Isn't that profoundly false? I'm going to show you the Bible verses that tell you that this man is speaking lies and untruths doctrinally, right? The only way we get plugged into eternal life isn't through Jewish people. It's through Christ. Look at the second one. What happens when the Messiah comes? What happens? He is in charge. Look at this church. Technically, it will be a global theocracy. Where in the Bible does it teach you that when Jesus comes, he's going to set up a theocracy on earth? My Bible tells me that we're going to be caught up to meet him in the air and that we're going to go and be with him for a thousand years during the millennial and the, the millennium. And that's what's going to happen. You know, they teach Dr. Tony Evans, who is um, a very, very famous uh, 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 radio preacher in the States, uh, affiliated with the Dallas Theological Seminary in Texas. Tony Evans, I heard him preach the sermon where he said, Jesus is going to come to earth. He's going to sit in this temple, I guess, after the Antichrist is kicked out. And he's going to rule the world for a thousand years by force. He's going to make the world keep his commandments. There is not a thing in the Bible that would make you think that Jesus would force you to do anything. In fact, it is, it is um, freedom of choice. It is, it is the great monkey wrench of the entire universe. Did you all know that, church? It is the fact that we have free choice that all of the catastrophe happens. When you look at why so much evil happens in the world, it is because God does not force men to do things. Man can choose. And not only can man choose to do evil, wicked things, God, because of his, his respect for your individual right to choose, he doesn't even just eliminate the consequences. Because if he always eliminated the consequence of evil uh, uh, actions, then you still wouldn't have freedom of choice. You cannot understand the great controversy if you don't understand. God loves you so much. There's one thing God cannot do. Well, there's a few things. He can't lie either. One thing God cannot do is this. God cannot force you to love him. If he tried to force you to love him, it would cease to be love instantaneously. Hence, you were created with a son of we'll talk about tomorrow at Sabbath school, and an ability to make a choice to accept Jesus Christ as your savior. If he did, it, the world could be a, 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 a peaceful, wonderful place if he made all of us essentially robots that simply did what he said. But God created you because he loves you and wants to receive love from you. That's why this false prophecy is so diabolical. Look at the third one. And do we use the term apocalypse here? Is that being applied? Look at what he says. There's nothing apocalyptic about it. It's a blessing. A blessing that Jesus comes to earth kicks down the door and forces everybody to behave? Here's what he says. The next question. What do you think people are imagining when they hear Israel? And is it some sort of biblical idea? Or is it the country where people are rude to each other and live and breathe? What is Israel? What does Israel mean? And this is the Jewish reporter asking him. Here's what Hagee responds. To the Christian community, let's start with Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the city of God. That's in the Bible word for word. That Jerusalem is the place where God has caused his name to be written. That's word for word out of the scripture. Jerusalem is the place where Abraham placed his son Isaac on the altar on the Temple Mount to sacrifice him to prove to the God, to prove to the God that he could not see, and, be, and he became the father of many nations. Jerusalem is the place where Isaiah and Jeremiah penned the principles of righteousness that became the moral compass of Western for Western civilization. Jerusalem is the place that David captured. Uh, from the Jebusites 33,000 years ago. Jerusalem is the place, watch this church, Jerusalem is the place that as Christians, Jesus Christ was crucified outside the city, and this is where the epicenter of the millennial kingdom is going to be. Is that what we believe? Absolutely not. Polar opposite. With a Jewish Messiah on the throne, where righteousness, where righteous Jews and righteous Gentiles will be a part of that eternal kingdom, Jerusalem is the shoreline of eternity. This is not biblical at all. From a different article, this says this. And of course, the church is called the body of Christ. 
So when Paul spoke of the Antichrist, this is to give you the right inclination on this. So when Paul spoke of the Antichrist sitting in the temple of God in 2 Thessalonians, he was not referring to a rebuilt Jewish temple, but rather to the Antichrist power placing himself at the head of the Christian church. Because that's the temple now. The temple now are those who claim to be followers of Christ. And a false person is taking the head seat. And I showed you pictures of that yesterday. Right now, the Lutherans, Pentecostals, Congregationalists, everyone is united under the umbrella of the Vatican. There's one, basically soon to be one large, ultimately weaved together system of believers. And here's the challenge you have as a Seventh-day Adventist. You will stand out because you will believe that you don't need to go to a priest to ask for forgiveness. Because you will believe that Mary has no special power more than any other woman who lived. You will believe that the seventh day is the Sabbath. And that when you die, you do not go to purgatory or heaven or hell. That when you die, you sleep and await the second coming of our Lord. These precious truths should be preached in our pulpits regularly. Because they, they separate us. The Bible says that we are to be a, a royal priesthood. A peculiar people. If we're just like everybody else, we're in trouble. The third lesson. Lesson number three, if you want to understand what's going on in the Middle East right now. The temple we need already exists. That's Hiram Memphis after the great disappointments of artist rendition. And you know, I don't know if you can imagine what it would have been like in 1844, that October, after so many had sacrificed so much, waiting for this Lord to come. Jesus didn't return to ridicule. Hiram Benson was so ridiculed in his town that he cut through cornfields to get home because everywhere they went, the Adventists were being mocked. He was throwing things at them. He cut through the field and God gave him the vision that in fact, what happened in October of 1844 was that Christ moved from the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary into the most holy place where that would be cleansed. It was the, uh, the, the, the statement and the symbol of the fact that the cleansing of the temple is the is the is the is the final judgment. So we have a belief in an investigative judgment that started in 1844. It's a unique belief, one also that we get mocked for, but that's all right. I'm going to show you from the Bible that this idea of a heavenly temple is a real thing. Here we go, Hebrews 8, verse 1. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and what? And not man. So wait a minute. If God is a tabernacle that he's pitched where Jesus is right now functioning as high priest, and that started in October of 1844, if I built the third temple, what would anybody do with it? Let's keep going. Hebrews 9, 11. But Christ being, being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Somebody ought to say amen. There's no need for a temple on earth. We don't have to kill goats, cows, and pigeons and stuff. But I have to do that stuff. Why? Because the lamb that was flayed, slain from the foundation of the world is Christ Jesus himself. And our God is not, our Christ is not just the high priest. He's also the sacrificial lamb. This high priest went in with his own blood. Somebody ought to say, man, this is powerful Christianity. And he entered once having obtained eternal redemption for us, what would they do in a third temple? Let me tell you something. This is righteousness by faith. Man, this thing ought to liberate you. You've got a, you got, you have in the heavens right now, you have a high priest who was tempted in all points like you are, yet without sin. He can make your case in the final judgment like no one else can. Jesus knows what it's like to be fatherless like I was. He knows what it's like to be called names. He knows what it's like uh, to be uh, uh, abused and neglected. No one has suffered like Christ suffered. 
Christ didn't just suffer in the human. He didn't just suffer like a slave might have suffered on a plantation in Alabama. Christ suffered not just as a man. He suffered as the divine. Hence, no one has ever suffered like he suffered. And he suffered, the scripture says, by his stripes are we healed. This is the plan of salvation. It's righteousness by faith. It is his righteous robe that will cover me on the day of judgment as he's in that temple. And my name, Eric Walsh, comes up on the screen. And everyone in the universe looks to see the dirt that I did. And we now spend eternity. All of a sudden, the screen will go blood red. She has been covered by my blood. And I stand before the judgment seat of God as if I had never seen and had never sinned covered in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's Christianity, church. Hebrews 9, verse 23. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for who? For us. When they said, when they read the 2300 day prophecy, and they said unto 2300 days, and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, you almost have to wonder if God shielded their eyes from these verses. Because as you study in the book of Hebrews, and God allowed, let me say this about the great disappointment. God allowed the great disappointment for the Advent last day church, the God's remnant church, just as he did for his disciples when he died. Did you know they went through a great disappointment as well? That's why when he, they were hiding up in the upper room, fearful for their lives, when Mary came to tell them that Jesus had risen. They went through a great disappointment as well. Oftentimes, God's allow, God allows people to go through disappointment before he does great things with them. And that group that was thousands and thousands of people strong, waiting for the second coming, dropped down to a number like 50. And our church is not the church that went through the great disappointment. Our church was birthed after that. And God saw fit to allow only a handful of faithful people to start this Advent movement because if it had started with a thousand people who were not true blue, who were not rooted and grounded, we would have died off a long time ago. The great Disappointment was really a great purging. It was allowing God to pull off the drunk, pull off that which was not serious, and allow those who would stand. And you see, when you read about the early church, as we're studying um, uh, at home, you, when you read about the early church, you find some powerful stuff. Because when those apostles finally are unleashed in the old in, in, in the new in the, in the New Testament, you see what they do. But the same thing happens. The founders of this denomination are unleashed as well. Gospel goes around the globe. Think about just a handful of people in New England. Yet, here in Australia, look at how strong the church is. You have an Ellen White House here. Andrews went to Europe. I mean, the church went all over the place. Because they under, once they understood this doctrine, this doctrine that they're still trying to mess up and make you think a third temple has to be built, and tax dollars are being spent to support war to build that temple. That's what Revelation says. Revelation 21 and verse 1 says this. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And the Bible says that there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the, look at this, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. The tabernacle, the sanctuary, is going to dwell with us. How? Jesus will walk up and down with each one of us. And is it going to happen in Jerusalem, where in Jeru as Jerusalem sits now? No. Nope. John first says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. So what are these other people talking about? I want to see the new earth. In fact, the beauty of the new earth is that as the new Jerusalem ascends, as described in, in, in verse 2, we would have been when Jesus caught up in the air to spend the millennium with, him, with millennium with him, we'd be up in the air and we'll be able to peek over the walls of that city 
and watch this world be recreated. Ellen White says this, Southern Watchman, January 24, 1905. Those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease in a sanctuary above are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Their robes must be spotless. Their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in a battle with evil. While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of the penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of purification, of putting away of sin among God's people on, upon earth. This work is more clearly presented in the messages of Revelation 14, the three angels' messages. The work that we are to do now is the development of character that is like Christ. I had a discussion with some of the folk in the youth tent the other night, and I can tell you there are a lot of folk that are afraid when you use words like, you, you, we as Christians should be perfect. The Bible says, be perfect as I am perfect. That's what God says. But God is speaking to the perfection of character. I want you to get that. How do I know this? Because Moses, the Bible says in Numbers 12, he was the most meek man in the whole world. Yet, when Moses was a, just before, not too long before Moses died, he was instructed to do what to the rock? Speak to the rock. What did he do? Struck the rock and said some other stuff he shouldn't have said. He struck the rock. That was, he failed. He fell. He sinned. And so God punished him by not allowing Moses into the promised land. He went up on the mountain. He could see it, but he couldn't go in. And he died there. If he had, if that imperfection had tarnished his character completely, what happens in the book of Jude couldn't have happened. The Bible tells us that Michael the archangel, who is Christ, comes and does what for Moses? Resurrects him and takes him to heaven. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Moses had the character of Christ. He slipped and fell. But I've told you this all week. A just man falls seven times and rises every time. I'm not telling you you go out and you're never going to make another mistake. What I tell you is that every day you grow to be more and more and more like Jesus. That's character development. Fourth lesson. The wider conflict means wider chaos and opportunity for greater global change. Now, as Americans, one of the most frightening things that we experience, and I still remember it, everybody can say, where were you when 9-11 happened? I can still remember exactly where I was and what I was doing. When those, when those planes crashed into the Twin Towers that day, panic ran through the American people. Anger ran through the American people. The American people were united. I mean, people weren't fighting over politics. Americans wanted revenge. They wanted that threat removed. That was all that mattered. But what actually came out of that catastrophe from a, from, from a policy standpoint? First of all, one of the policies that came out of it was something called the Patriot Act. You guys heard of this? In it, American uh, civil liberties were basically repealed in ways that would have been impossible without 9-11. Uh, what else happened? Well, uh, Dick Cheney wanted to go into Iraq, George W. Bush, Wanted revenge on Saddam Hussein because he said he tried to kill his father. Uh, right, so he wanted these guys wanted revenge. They made up the story about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and we went in and slaughtered innocent people, all on the back of what happened on 9/11. But that's the facts. I mean, I'm an American citizen. I love my country. But those are the facts. What I want to submit to you is that when you see war, war expand like this, there are evil forces that will use war and conflict to advance their cause in ways that you and I are not necessarily thinking about, right? They will use catastrophe. When, 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 um, the, when, the, when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, wiped out the city, they used it to change the city forever. Poor neighborhoods were torn down and expensive high-rises went up. Out of chaos, they will make change. Watch this. So we saw recently uh, Iran and Israel recent attacks explained. And so you saw uh, uh, Iran attack Israel because Israel hit an uh, embassy in Syria and killed an Iranian general. Uh, of course, Iran couldn't leave that be, so they sent like 300 plus drones and missiles. Israel's um, defense thing stopped it along with the United Kingdom and the United States of America, military forces. Um, and then, of course, Israel responded, and it seems like Iran may have stopped it. I don't know what happened. I came to Australia and 
can't get the news like I do normally. So all of this fighting happened. I want to submit to you one thing first when these wars begin to break out. I want to remind you of something I said earlier in the week. Matthew 24 and verse 6. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. Why, when we hear of these wars, are we not to be troubled? For all these things that must come to pass, but the end is what? Not yet. God would not allow the world to be destroyed by war. And it's going to follow the rest of the chapter of Matthew 24. Now, this is what happened. When you have this chaos, it's the response. So, yesterday I talked about spiritualism. One of the points I, I didn't get to to make is the point that one of the reasons the devil wants to raise up, this is, this, this is a reaction to the satanic temple I talked to you about yesterday. This political group uh, based in Salem, uh, Massachusetts, who goes around and does lawsuits and stuff for the cause of Satanism. And the reaction to it is this. Be gone, Satan. Mary crushes the serpent. Does Mary crush the serpent in the Bible? Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, who crushes the serpent? The seed of the woman, who is Christ Jesus. You see what happens? So you make all of this spiritualism, we were talking about this yesterday, you make all this spiritualism, you put it in popular culture, you make the, those that do not understand scripture properly, you rile them up, and they react. And in the reaction is how you can get the move towards a Sunday law to actually happen. Because in America, what is happening? I don't know if it's happening in Australia the same way, but I know it's here as well. There are those who want to make America Christian again. And they will do it by hook or by crook and by legislation. And war and, and, and immorality and, and all of the things that you're seeing are the ways that they want to swing the pendulum back further than it ever was. This is why we as admins are in a catch-22 situation politically. You can't side with the left because you don't really get down with what they believe and how they practice. You have a hard time really aligning yourself with the right because you ultimately know they want to change the, at least in the States, they want to, and I showed you some of that yesterday, they want to change the way the country is run so that it is a Christian nation. The problem with that is, what type of Christianity? Who's Christianity? The fifth Final lesson is this one. The real war is with spiritual Israel. When you see all that's going on in the Middle East, and it's very shocking, surprising, it's actually very sad to see the destruction. I can't imagine how the Gaza ever gets rebuilt. I mean, it, it, it really is heartbreaking on both sides. What happened on October 7th was terrible. But understand that we are involved in a great controversy. And that ultimately, the crosshairs are on the true believers in this world. Right? So the question, the first question you have to ask is, who is Israel? Today, who is Israel? Here's what the Bible says. John chapter 1 and verse 11 says this. He came unto his own, and his own did what? Received him not. But as many as received him, if you received him, this is what happened. I know this term, the sons of God is. It's back in the book of Genesis. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took wives to themselves. Who were the sons of God? Some people say these were aliens. It was absolutely not aliens. These were the sons, the descendants of Seth, the righteous lineage on earth. When you accept Jesus Christ, you are plugged in. You are a son of God like Adam was. You're plugged all the way back in. <laughs> Even to them that believe on his name, which were born, watch this, not of blood. This is not genetic DNA relationship to Abraham. We're born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man. How were you born? You were born of what? God. This is spiritual Israel. First John 3 says it like this. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. One of my favorite Bible verses right here. That we should be called the sons, and I throw it in daughters, we should be called the sons and daughters of God. Therefore, the world knows us not because it knew him not. Beloved, we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, what, what are we going to be like? We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. This is character development. When he comes, we will be like him. Jesus is returning for people whose character looks like his character. 
In the last days, that was what will happen. But I love it. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. We should be called the children of God. I don't have to do um, DNA tests. What are they, 21 and me, 23 and me? What do they do it? Right? And all these other things. One of them went bankrupt. And all this genetic testing. All, I, don't, I don't care where I come from. I care where I'm going. I'm concerned with what mix of blood I have in my body. I'm going to get a glorified body when Jesus comes. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we will all be changed. First John 3, 3, and every man that had this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. This is the purification of character, church. We have a great work to do. Great work to do. Second Peter 2.20 says this. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Because a lot of them teach also that once you're saved, you're always saved. Here's what the Bible says on that. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog has turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Church, what we have been exposed to, what we've been given, you are been called to be children of God. Do not turn from it. Do not give up the legacy you have been handed. The privilege we have to live in this day with all the knowledge we have as Christians, understanding the plan of salvation the way we do, and having all the information that we are given as Adventists, it is a privilege that when we get to heaven, others will look to us and ask us how it felt. Luke 19 and verse 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known even thou, at least in this day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. That Jesus wept over Jerusalem. They think you're going to rebuild Jerusalem and build a temple there. Jesus wept over it, knowing that this was the end of it. For the day shall come upon thee at thine, that, thine, that thine enemy shall cast the trench about thee. This is talking about 80, 70. And come past thee round about and keep thee in on every side. Verse 44, and they shall, and they sh and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of your visitation. Church, do you know the time of this visitation? Do you know how soon Jesus is about to return? Are we prepared for what's about to happen? I'll end with this quote from the Spirit of Prophecy. The sin of the world today is the sin that brought destruction upon Israel. Ingratitude to God. The neglect of opportunities and blessings. The selfish ap appropriation of God's gifts. These were com comprised in the sin that brought wrath upon, Isra uh, upon Israel. They are bringing ruin upon the world today. The tears which Christ shed upon all of it as he stood overlooking the chosen city were not for Jerusalem alone. In the fate of Jerusalem, he beheld the destruction of the world. If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. In this day, Ellen White says, the day is nearing its close. The period of mercy and privilege is well nigh ended. The clouds of vengeance, church, are gathering. The rejectors of God's grace are about to be involved in swift and irretrievable ruin. Yet the world is what? Asleep. The people know not the time of their visitation. Church, I'll leave you with this verse. Ephesians 5, 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. This is what Jesus says, or Paul speaks about the church in the last days, that he might present it to himself, the church, a glorious church, not having a spot or a wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The war in the Middle East, in many ways, is a distraction, church. And don't get me wrong, what's happening is terrible, and if I had a way to stop it, I would. But I tell you this, there will be more wars. There will be more uh, conflict. 
We as Christians must understand where we are in prophecy. And we must stay faithful to God no matter what happens. We must understand the severity of the times and we must determine in our hearts for ourselves, for our families, for our children, that we are going to follow Jesus Christ no matter what. I went through some stuff. I don't know if I'll get a chance to tell my testimony here, but I remember I lost a job over my religious beliefs very publicly. I wound up on Fox News and CNN and all kinds of stuff. And I remember after I lost that job, the job I loved, the job I was very good at, running a health department in California. I remember one of the guys I worked with, one of the nonprofit organizations, the guy uh, called me after I was having to give up the job. He said, Dr. Walsh, we loved working with you. He said, we'd love to keep working with you, and we think we have a way that you can keep your job. He said, listen, we're going to call a press media meeting together. He said, and all you have to do is go in there and basically paraphrasing what he said is, if you'll recant what you believe, if you'll go on camera and just say, listen, I don't really believe this, and you, I, I was misunderstood, or that I no longer believe it, if you just go in there and say these things, we'll get you your job back. I said, sir, I would rather shovel dung in the streets of Los Angeles than to deny the God who saved me. I made a decision that day to lose the job. God worked it all out for my benefit in the long run. Praise the Lord. But let me tell you something. The war that is to be fought is a war of conviction that what we believe we will stand for. But guess what? You can't stand for what you don't know. You have to study to show yourself. Uh, that's 2 Timothy chapter 2, 15 and 16. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Paul says, rightly dividing the word of truth. Get into the word and ask the Holy Spirit to lead you as you study it, to lead you into all truth. Playtime church is over. You're going to see these things happening. In fact, Sister White says the last events will be rapid ones. Jesus is about to return. I know what's going on in the world. It's crazy. The wars. We must turn our eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I should have my wife sing that song before we close out. That is where we are. She'll say it. We have a, we have a couple minutes. That's a hint, hint. There's, like I said in the first session today, there's a peace that comes with knowing Jesus. Yeah. When I buried my mother, it was very difficult and challenging. But God spoke to me. God said to me, she has been perfected. I would see my mother again. I, I have that hope. I don't, it's not even a hope. It's, it's something I know. That I will see my mother daily, that I must stay faithful on this path, that I must make Jesus my all, that I must live for him no matter what is going on in the world. Church, this is the time to turn our eyes towards Jesus, to look full in his wonderful face so that the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace.